The following video contains graphic retirement and RV travel information. Viewer discretion is advised. Hey guys, welcome back to the channel. Are you thinking about retired RV life and you're not sure if it's right for you? On today's video, Lisa and I are going to share with you some of our thoughts and insights after one year of full-time RV travel, so stay tuned. Okay guys, so welcome back. So before we get started, Lisa and I wanted to kind of share with you a little bit of our background and kind of uh, provide you with some insights on why we decided uh, RV uh, travel and retirement was right for us. So Lisa, kind of share a little bit of where we were at in our life. Uh, we had just retired yep. after 33 years in the military and we were at a crossroad. Um, we were unsure where we wanted to live. Our, both the boys were in the military. We didn't want to go back to our hometown. We hadn't lived there in 33 years. Yeah, we really, we wanted some freedom and flexibility. We wanted to be able to travel and go where we wanted, when we wanted to. Right. And, and like Lisa said, you know, we had just retired out of the military and we were very familiar with that kind of nomadic lifestyle. Right, right. Yeah. We, and we loved it. Yeah, and because we didn't own a home at the time, we didn't have to worry about, you know, what we were going to do with a home. And we decided that if we were going to travel, uh, this would be the best time for right. us. I think we both really enjoy being out in nature and outdoor activities. Mm -hmm. Lisa just loves going to the beach. I love the mountains. Uh, she likes to go collect seashells and spend time in the sand. I like to uh, mountain bike. I like to hike. And we both love to go kayaking. Yes, yes. So really, that's kind of the genesis of where we, dis we were at in our life when mm -hmm. we decided uh, that we wanted to go ahead and venture off into uh, retirement RV lifestyle. Mm -hmm. So with that said, what we really want to do in this video is share with you some of those insights, some of those um, lessons learned, and even some questions that we were asked yeah. you know, about retired RV life and whether it's right for you or not. Now, this is just going to kind of be limited to probably the top 10 questions that we've been asked or that we had uh, when we were deciding on this. Mm -hmm. But uh, we'll go ahead and get started with that and kind of share with you some of those thoughts and insights. Right. So, so Lisa, what was the first question that uh, we had to answer and that other people are probably having to answer as well? Which RV is best for a retired travel? Yeah, no RV is perfect. You kind of have to make do but you have to find out which RV is best for you and your family and the camping style you want to do and you know what works best for you. Yeah, I, I would agree. It, are you planning on full-time camping? Are you planning on part-time camping? Are you going to be um, traveling solo? Or are you going to be traveling as a couple? Are you going to be traveling with kids? Right. Um, is one of the you know, partners or both of you are going to have to remote work. So there's a right. lot of questions you would have to answer. But like Lisa said, there's no perfect RV. There's just the best RV for you. Right. And, you know, for us, we chose an Airstream. And if you're interested in, in Airstreams, we have another video. And I'll provide a link either here or over here. <laughs> or down here. Or, or wherever there. it's at. Um, if you're interested in Airstream and and some of those considerations. And whether you're interested in other RVs, I think that video will also help you kind of think through some of those questions of how do you choose the right RV right. for retirement travel. So the next question that we uh, get asked a lot is how do we plan uh, our RV trips um, and find our campsites? And when we were getting ready to start, I'd looked at all types of different websites. I'd watched a lot of YouTube videos. And what we found was RV Trip Wizard. Now, we're not sponsored by them. It's just an online uh, program that you can subscribe to. And we use it uh, to, to plan all of our routes and to find the campgrounds we want to stay at. As well as we also use, of course, Google Maps. And, mm -hmm. and we just also use other, a few other apps when we start reviewing and looking at you know, the ratings on those campgrounds. Right. So Lisa, what's the other questions that we get asked? The next question we've been asked is RV travel, is it safe? Uh, but we've been very fortunate we haven't had any type of uh, accidents while traveling. No, no. 
Uh, but we have been uh, severe weather. We've had tornado sirens go off at two different campgrounds we've been at. So yeah. uh, last night about 2 a.m. we got woke up by uh, tornado warnings uh, going off on our phones. Uh, we're down here in the Pensacola, Florida area. But it's just a, a reminder that if you're out traveling, especially in an Airstream or some other type of RV, that you've got to be aware of the weather around you. Make sure you've got a severe weather plan in case you have to evacuate or seek shelter. So uh, everything's good where we're at. Tornado is about a half a mile away from our campsite. Uh, no damage, but just a reminder, be safe out there and we'll see you down the road. Yeah. And you know, again, acts of God, you can't really control those, but you can be prepared for them. Right, right. You know, knowing what you need to do in the event of severe weather, making sure you have all the right equipment, right. good flashlights, batteries, a NOAA weather radio. Right. But probably even more important than even any of those, as well as different apps on your phone, is knowing where to seek shelter. Um, right, exactly. Yeah, so, you know, with just a little bit of pre-planning, you know, you can make RV travel just as safe as if you were living at home because tornadoes or hurricanes or severe weather can strike at home just as it can right. while you're on the road. Right. So it's just, uh, you just have to be prepared and, and uh, just be weather aware. So um, probably the, the fourth question that we got asked and that I've had to answer quite frequently and you've probably seen a lot of my videos on this <laughs> channel is how do we maintain our Airstream or our RV uh, while we're on the road. And just like a house, you have to maintain uh, your home, uh, you have to maintain your RV. And you know, there's, if you got the owner's manual, it'll tell you kind of what the scheduled maintenance should be. If you're somewhat handy, you can do, I would say almost all of that yourself, as long as you're physically able and, uh, and you have some basic, you know, maintenance right. skills. Um, but yeah, it's, it's really not that difficult. It's just keeping track of what maintenance needs to be done and then uh, just putting that on your calendar and just setting aside a time or a day to do that. Now that's for scheduled maintenance. Now the, the type of maintenance that you don't want is unscheduled maintenance. That's when something breaks and those things are going to happen when you're driving down the road and you're shaking your RV, you know, mm -hmm. like a you know, 5.0 or whatever it is on the Richter scale of an earthquake, yeah. things are going to vibrate loose, they're going to break. Uh, you the just, water pump broke. Yeah, and, or there's just the life expectancy of a piece of equipment such as the water pump yeah. gets exceeded and you just have to be able to replace those. Um, we have been able to get parts and again I will keep you know, singing the praise of Woodland <laughs> Airstream. They've got probably the best online parts store uh, that I found and uh, within a day or two. Oh, delivery is so fast. Yeah, you can get it ordered, you can talk to their shipping department, make sure that they know where to ship it to. So if you haven't checked into that, um, I would highly recommend that you check out Woodland Airstream and their online parts store. Um, but also, if you have other questions, there's another video here <laughs> here on how we maintain yeah. our uh, Airstream while we're traveling on the road. So Lisa, what else are some of the other questions that we've been asked? Healthcare. How do you do healthcare on the road? And we haven't done so well on this. I mean, um, well, knock on wood. Yeah, fortunately, we haven't had we've, to use it. Yeah, we've been very, very, very blessed. Yeah, been, but we've been healthy. Yeah, um, we haven't had any significant illnesses or injuries while traveling. I think yeah. the worst event was I cracked a tooth. And because I am retired military, I was able to go to a VA clinic. Uh, and get uh, some dental care. But other than that, we haven't had any yeah. major injuries or no. sicknesses. You know, and I, being retired military, you know, I, we are through the military system, retired military system, so we can get health care if we need to, um, but you'll, you know, you'll have to do health care, figure that out. Yeah, and you know, even just getting prescriptions on the road, um, can be a bit of a challenge, but if you just kind of work through, you know, like CVS, Walgreens, Walmart, or some of those yeah. other, um, you know, um, national uh, pharmacies, you can get your yeah. your prescriptions to where you can pick those up while you're traveling on the road. So just some things that you got to think through, and we are by no means experts in that. Definitely, we're definitely not. Yeah, we're still learning that process, and. Uh, but it hasn't been something that I would say would stop us from traveling, and I don't think it should stop you from traveling as well. Another question we get asked is, how comfortable is full-time or just 
RV travel in general. Right. And, you know, again, it, it's going to depend on how you define comfortable. I mean, we have an air conditioner, we have a microwave, we have TV, we have internet, we have nice, comfortable beds, mm -hmm. we have heaters, you know, so it's not like we're tent camping. And we've done that in our younger years, but as we've gotten older... <laughs> yeah, no, you're not going to get me to, you know... Tent camp? camp? Yeah. <laughs> yeah no, 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 no. Those days are over. And now we by no means are glampers. No. Uh, but we're also not to the point to where we're going to be roughing it, living out on the ground in a tent. So comfort is very subjective, but I would tell you, you know, whatever RV you get, you know, it's going to be smaller space than what you're going to have in your home. Right. It's going to have limited storage. Uh, your bathroom facilities are going to be smaller, not going to be quite as nice and elaborate. But if you can adapt to that, you can make RV travel and RV as comfortable as you want it to be. Mm -hmm. And there are upgrades that you can make to your Airstream or your RV. Um, you know, to make it even more comfortable. For us, uh, one thing we did is we installed the Froley sleep system right. to improve the comfort of our, our mattresses and beds. Uh, again, made a video of that. If you're interested on that, it, it was a great investment. Oh, um, it definitely was. It was a definitely one, was. you know, a probably a one day install for me because I was filming it, but for an average person with average uh, skill set, you can get it done in probably three, four hours, uh, if you just focus on that. It, it was a great investment and and, and uh, probably one of the best upgrades we made as right. far as in, increasing the comfort level of our Airstream. Yeah. So, Lisa, what's another question that we got asked? We always get asked about mail. How do you get your mail on the road? And we have the, our, our snail mail sent to his mom in Texas. Yeah, that's our address. Our yeah, home address our home is address. at my mother's house. And then... Amazon, FedEx, um, UPS, and all that. Usually you can ask the campground you're at, and usually you can get those delivered at the campground or Amazon Locker is usually close by if you're in a yeah. big town. Absolutely. Most campgrounds that we've been to um, don't have any restrictions with receiving uh, packages, and uh, you can usually get them delivered right to your campsite. If not at your campsite, then at least to the office. The office, yeah. Um, another alternative is Amazon lockers, and we've done that on the road too. Mm -hmm. And those are usually at uh, grocery stores or convenience stores, and relatively easy. You just find that location, you put it in your Amazon profile, and then any packages you have delivered yeah. are sent there. You're, you receive a code on your um, email or on your phone, and then when you get there, you punch in that code, it unlocks the locker, and you retrieve whatever it is you yeah, ordered. So, nice, simple. Yeah, so that's another alternative. So that's something uh, that is relatively easy to work around. And again, if you're full-timing, a little bit more of a challenge. If you're part-timing, it's really not gonna be a challenge. Yeah. You can just put your mail on hold while you're gone. And the, probably the other thing that we get asked a lot is how do we stay connected? So Lisa, yeah. what you know, what do you what are your thoughts on that? Well, for Wi-Fi, um, we do T-Mobile. Yep, we use the T-Mobile home internet. Yeah, fifty dollars a month for unlimited 5G um, data. So yeah, and it's been pretty good. We've had had it. It's been pretty good everywhere we've been. I, there's yeah. been a couple places it's been slow, but not many. Yeah, so it's it's really been uh, a great feature for us. Uh, but for our our cell phone plans, we use Verizon. Verizon yeah. And we purposely chose an alternative right. carrier because we didn't want to just be on one carrier's network. So if we were traveling somewhere and T-Mobile didn't have good coverage, we could still use our phones for either hotspots, at least make phone calls and other things. Yeah. And vice versa, if Verizon wasn't uh, right. providing good coverage in that area, we then could rely on uh, yeah. T-Mobile. Something that's new that I'm sure many of you are interested in is Starlink. Now we, we've seen people using Starlink. Yeah. I've talked to people using Starlinks. Just like any other uh, you know, system, it's gonna have its positives, pros and cons. Um, we haven't decided to make that leap yet. We right. haven't needed to. Now in the future, maybe we will. And yeah, when we so. get somewhere, I always set up the antenna just for local channels. Just one thing for weather. So that if we do get bad weather in that area, we listen to the weather that evening yeah, absolutely. So that's that is uh, very critical. Other than just watching it or getting a weather app on your phone, 
sometimes you don't always get the nuances uh, that you do get from watching a local weather channel. So back to the question about safety, that's another reason uh, why it's important to have multiple methods uh, to track the weather around you. The most asked question that I think uh, many people have is how much does RV travel cost? For Lisa and I, you know, before we decided uh, to start retirement RV travel, we did what we thought was prudent. We sat down and kind of made out a budget and, and tried to identify what we thought our expenses were gonna be. And we set some goals as far as how much we wanted to spend on uh, camping and tried to anticipate what fuel costs would be, how much we would spend on food, entertainment, and all those other things. Again, it was a best guess estimate. Right. And I think we've done a pretty good job sticking to that estimate. I think we estimated right around $5,000 a month. Some months were higher, some months were lower. But you know what we want to do is just kind of share with you our travels and just kind of talk with you about how we've been traveling this last year and share with you some of those expenses that we had. So I'm, I got my iPad here, uh, as you can see, and I've got a few notes on here. So we really broke up the year into four parts and we just went with the seasons, uh, spring, summer, fall, and winter. And during our spring trip, we actually uh, stayed mostly in the southeast and into a little bit of the Midwest. Uh, most of that was traveling to visit uh, family and friends. We ended up staying at 12 different locations. We drove over 5,000 miles um, and our average cost per night was uh, $17.53 per night. We had budgeted $50 per night but because we had stayed at state parks and harvest hosts and uh, mooch docked with family, we were able to cut that cost down substantially. Our total camping fees, $1,894, and our fuel cost was $2,067. So our expenses for that trip were $3,961 for our spring trip. So moving on to our summer trip, so this one here, took us from Alabama up into Maine and we pretty much spent the whole summer up in the New England states and we ended up staying at uh, 10 different locations. Let me put my reading glasses back on so I can read my notes here. We drove over 4,620 miles. Now you can see our average cost per night jumped up uh, to about $61 yeah. a night. Camp fees were $3,603. Our fuel costs uh, were $1,798 uh, for fuel and then our total cost for that summer trip was $5,401. Moving forward then into the fall and our whole objective now was to start chasing 70 degrees. As the fall temperature started uh, to drop we wanted just to stay right around that 70 degree mark and we started working our way south along the east coast and on that trip, we stayed at seven different locations. Mm -hmm. We drove 3,963 miles. Our average cost per night was $27.95. Our camping fees for that fall trip were $2,236. Our fuel costs were $1,532. And our total costs for that fall trip were $3,768. We really started spending more time near the water. This is when Lisa wanted to get out by the beaches. Mm -hmm. uh, we're down in Virginia Beach, and mm -hmm. then we also went out to Ocracroke oh. Island. Oh man, yeah. And uh, again, there's a video for that. Um, that was a great trip for us. It's definitely a, a place that we want to go back and oh, visit again. Yes. If you've got any tips on Ocracroke, uh, let us know because we definitely want to head back there again. So on our winter trip, we were basically staying in the southeast and then after the first of the year we were going to migrate down into florida again with the objective of chasing 70 degree weather we visited four different states drove 4,284 miles our average cost was 29 dollars 91 cents per night we stayed at one state park uh, did courtesy parking at one time and if you've never done courtesy parking through the airstream club international um, highly recommend yes, it yes. you'll get to meet some great folks um, and again i got a video for that if you're interested in that as well uh, our camping fees 
for that duration of time were three thousand five hundred and fifty nine dollars our fuel costs were one thousand uh, six hundred and sixty seven dollars for a total cost on that winter trip of five thousand two hundred and twenty six dollars so in one year we visited 21 states we traveled over 18,149 miles with an average cost of $30.85 per night. So our total camping fees for one year was $11,292. Our fuel cost was $7,064 for a total cost of $18,356. And I don't know about Lisa, I haven't asked her this question yet, but was it worth it? It was definitely worth it. We have no regrets as far as no. uh, RV retirement travel. Now, whether it's full time or part time, you know that's that's really situational dependent. And you know, most people that do full time eventually know that they're going to come off the road, and they'll probably then revert to part time travel, or because, most time, or most time. Yeah, however you want to uh, categorize it, and that may be something that we end up doing here in the future. So, Lisa, so if we were going to wrap this up. You know what what were the be the last three pieces of advice that we would want to give expect changes you know yeah i would say be flexible be flexible and embrace changes yeah. and the adventure and i would also say just have realistic expectations yes yeah you know what you see on youtube what you see on instagram that isn't necessarily reality yeah yeah you know. the, the other thing i would say is do your research and start slow um read blogs uh, get on different forums that yeah, watch youtube videos to learn from other people's experiences and hopefully that's what we're providing here back to the community right. is our insights and our experiences we're gonna i think we're gonna wrap this up i think we've kind of rambled on long enough <laughs> yeah. um, so if you like this video please consider uh, giving us a thumbs up um, if you haven't already done so uh, please consider subscribing to our channel we'd love to have you follow along we in would. our journey we really would and also, if you have any questions or comments, please leave those in the comment section below. Uh, I do my best to answer every question or comment that we get. And also, if we don't hear from you, um, hopefully we'll see you down the road. Yeah, let us know. Drop in on us. Say hi. Yeah, absolutely. So that's it for today, and uh, we'll see you down the road. See you down the road.